So I think mean, just tell Barry how much you love him now. Hey. <laughs> So, there, aren't, there aren't words to do it. I can't do that with just words. So. Barry, I left after you left, man. I can handle it. <laughs> you guys, uh, we've got Brian Irvin coming on here. So we've got a few questions for Brian. Straight is, he, to next. is he still police, Brian Irvin? Yeah, I think so. Brian, right. you're there. You can ask him. He's just popped up. Brian, yeah. uh, all right, all right. Every radio silence for a moment, as Brian would have said a couple of years ago. In two, all, <laughs> just two seconds, I'm just going to introduce Brian. Everybody here that's in twos yeah. is in a social bubble. It's fine, honest. <laughs> <laughs> Two secs. Try to get someone on the go here. There we go. Right. Delays, delays. Sorry, Brian. Two secs. No, not at all. Um, so like waiting for you to pass the ball, Adam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> other, other news. <laughs> <laughs> How bad is the Premier League? Is- <laughs> Which one? Just trying to get a sound going. Sorry, Brian. Are you off right now? Take your time. I'm early, I'm early, maybe. I don't know. I just, I'm not up oh, to you're, speed you're with the technology. Bad. I just. You're more up to speed than Adam is. I know. Technology. <laughs> Come on, you fucking thing. I mean, when, when lockdown, you'll be more up to speed than me. When lockdown started, it took me eight weeks to work out why the camera wasn't working because I'd pressed the button to put it off. <laughs> <laughs> You've worked out now, though, obviously. Uh, I'd, I'd, I had somebody younger from my team call me and talk me through it on the phone. You and technology, Callum, don't go together, mate. Okay, I think this is it now. Got an open fire out there to cut my dinner. Got a little intro. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brian Irvin, first of all, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Ninth on, the all, ninth on the all-time player attendance list for Aberdeen, believe it or not. 383 appearances and 40 goals. Oh, we've just lost him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure great. Be, I enjoyed that one last night. It was great. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be back in a second. <sighs> I'm sure you'll dial it in two secs. Um, our second guest, his wife has fallen on her arse outside his door, so um, it's touch and go whether or not he's going to come, but I think he probably will still come. He's going to come on at, um, at 7.45. So, we'll, uh, yeah. We'll Andy C. Oh, yeah. Is Andy. 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 Andy is still wearing your rugby top. I know. <laughs> <laughs> not quite ready to let go. Uh, you, 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 look so, you look so very similar to Gary Graham. I'm not actually sure you were just on the fucking pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I think, man, Gary, Gary Graham got hauled off after being brought on Aye. halfway through the first half. Because I think. Yeah, uh, Gary get... Graham last in the Premiership, but what a penalty machine he was today. Yeah, man, he gave away about <laughs> six not penalties. Not the game. <laughs> Oh. Andy, we did have our special guest there, but he heard you were coming on a call and he fucked off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've got Brian Irvin joining us, Andy. Oh, amazing. So I've got some questions for him. I've prepared some questions and I'll ask him some questions. And then after that, if you guys want, if anyone has any questions for him, chip in at the end. Yes. Yeah? So just let, let me get through the series of stuff so I can make it interesting yeah. to the call. Yeah. Otherwise, I just want to know if he dreams about that penalty kick every night. Hi, <laughs> I know. Fucking hell, I know I do. It's the last time. No. Do you know it's the last time we've won a, a final against Celtic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Must be. Yeah. God. That's that a, was 1990, wasn't it? 1990. 31 fucking years ago. He was Holy the last crap. guy. He was the last guy to win it for us. Let's see what the fuck's going on with him. <laughs> Here he goes. Here he goes again. He's back. You know. Ah, you made it back. He's still connecting audio. Hello there. Hi, Brian. There we go. This was good. There we go. Just proves that my uh, technology isn't good. So I was obviously <laughs> not clued in properly or tuned in properly, but we're okay now, are we? Uh, yeah, yeah. We should be okay. Was it too much for you, Brian? Was that intro just blew you away, did it? Yeah, that's a good description, Adam. Just blew me away. <laughs> I mean, 
if you're if you're feeling overly flattered by the compliments, I'll show you everybody here the best stat they've got is appearances too. <laughs> well, I, I just saw that today. No, I just saw that today. I was I was really uh, amazed to, to realise that you know it's league appearances as well. Remember that's not even all your appearances. So to be honest, well. I think it was fifteenth, is it? Is it? You see, well, yeah, I'm that, looking, I'm looking at the list of our Ryan FC records: three hundred and seven leagues. 30 Scottish Cup, 26 League Cup, 20 Europe's. And according to that, it puts you in ninth. In the overall ninth, yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw that one today, the league appearances. So that was great. I mean, I, I, I'm just a regular guy and I can't believe that I managed to play all those games for Aberdeen. You know, that's, that's always the way I look at it. And I think that's just amazing, actually. I think it, now when it's been so long ago, because obviously I retired, and left Aberdeen about 1997, I think it was, yeah, 97, so that's nearly 24 years ago. It just feels like it was somebody else, but what a privilege it was. I was just a fan that was able to play one game in the park, but to play all those games in the park, wow, that's just hard to believe that was really me. I mean, you're a, you're a guy from Airdrie, so what was it that made you support Aberdeen as a boy? Yeah, just... Yeah, that's a good question, Adam. No, I always supported Aberdeen because my family were all from Aberdeen. In the Ruri, um, my grand and grandpa were just near, near uh, outside in Ruri, heading towards Ains. So that was where we always used to go visiting when my dad was off uh, work. So the connection with Aberdeen was there as a young boy, even though I was living in Airdrie. And, and you know, Aberdeen were like, not, if they weren't, they weren't a good team, maybe not, not a good team, but they weren't the team that they were in the 80s, but they were still a good team when I was starting to become an interest in their uh, mid-70s when I first started following Aberdeen. And I remember going to my first Aberdeen game, I think it was maybe mid, mid-70s, mid 76 or so. Um, the, the connection with Aberdeen was just with the family. Although I'm, an, I'm not an Aberdeen upbringing in terms of being born and bred in Aberdeen, and, and all of our ways I really was. My dad was my mum from Aberdeen. Aberdeen Shire, and so we were just really living in the central belt just to my dad's work. But really, I was an Aberdeen boy, Aberdeen boy at heart. What did, what did your dad do down there? Oh, yeah, he, he was a policeman, so he oh, went, he yeah. moved down. He was in the north, uh, in the northeast. Obviously, he used to work at Embraer Locos, played with the Locos, and um, but when he then got a job with the police, he moved down to, to join the police in Lanarkshire, as it was at the time. So. The family re relocated. I had no say in the matter. I was only about two, I think. Really? So I just went with the family, obviously, and my mum and dad brought me up. And we used to go up regularly to visit Danny's grandpa's aunts and uncles, you know, two or three times a year. And in those days, it was a long journey from uh, Glasgow area to Aberdeen. It was about six hours in the car. Jesus. Obviously, now with the motorway and dual carriageway, it's a lot quicker, but you know, it was a long journey. And my dad and my there was three of us, three children, and my brother and sister in the car. It was a long journey, and I'm sure I must have told my mum and dad nuts. Are we were there yet? This is we left there, but probably for Aberdeen. But, um, it was great to get visiting, and uh, that was that was the connection again, Adam. Sorry. That's what our, uh, that's what our manager says sometimes to the wingers. Are you there yet? You know, time to <laughs> come up wing. Um, who was your yeah. Who was your idol growing up then? Was there somebody at Aberdeen, or was it somebody in, in the world, or who was, who was your player? Yeah, well, when I became old, a bit older, but, you know, and probably not that far behind him, as it turned out when I was playing alongside him, was big Alec, Alec McLeish. And he was, he was my football idol and became a teammate, which is that's ironic. But probably as a youngster, a real youngster, you know, the early players, like a, a guy called Drew Busby, Derek Whiteford, they were, they were, I used to go and watch Airdrie, obviously. At Aberdeen, probably, again, became interested in big Alec as a centre-half. But the overall idol I probably had a star I used to follow as a boy, as a youngster, really was Kendall Gleish. That was my year when he was the, the, the player. I mean, I guess everybody knows Kendall Gleish, but in my time he was a player with Celtic, and then he moved to Liverpool, and just so, so successful at Celtic and at Liverpool. And so he was, I liked everything about Kendall Gleish. He's obviously a great player, but also I liked his attitude. And, you know, he's so down to earth, Kendall Gleish, that you don't really think of him as a big star. And, you know, that's, that appeal to me, that type of attitude was, was great. I like that. Yeah, he was, certainly was a player, was he? Um, yeah. You know, obviously, Alex Ferguson signed you towards the end of his time with Aberdeen in uh, 1985. Um, what, I mean, what was that like? Did he come to your house? Did he, did he get a call? Was there a, was there agents back then? How, how did all that come about? 
Yeah, yeah, good, good. And there was agents about, but I didn't have an agent. I mean, that, that was always something I never, I don't boast about it, but I just never had an agent. It probably helped me to stay at Aberdeen because I had no intent to leave Aberdeen. And an agent might have put it in my head to get a better deal somewhere else. Um, I had two offers during my time at Aberdeen. It's one at Crystal Palace, one at Dundee. But again, I wasn't interested in, in the move from Aberdeen. Um, you know, I, I, I was keen to sign before my contract was up for Aberdeen, and that wasn't good business from a player's point of view. As, as you know, we're feeding my contract now. Players leave it to the end and then look at their options when the time comes. I was just keen to sign, and it was just sign the bit of paper that was, I was delighted. I didn't care what was on the paper. And that's now that you're older and wiser, if you like, that seems a bit silly to do that. That's not how business is done nowadays. And it, and it was the same when Alec Ferguson came to sign me. I, I didn't care what he was saying. I was just sitting there. It was from Blaine Hydro, him and Willie Gardner came down to sign me with Billy Lamont, the Falkett manager at the time. And he could have been saying anything. I didn't really take any of it in. And when I signed the contract, it was a blank contract. You know, I, I he said he'd fill it in later. And I thought it was going to be a three-year contract. And when I then got the contract signed back to me when I came up to Tordy and moved in, I realised it was a four-year contract. So I was delighted. But again, business-wise, that's not good. So basically, you've signed for another year for the same same uh, terms that you've agreed there. But as I say, Adam, the thing I was most interested in was just signing that bit of paper for Aberdeen. I wasn't interested in what was in the figures. The figures... You know, I could have signed for Charlton at the time. They were keen to sign me. And I met with Lenny Lawrence, the, the Charlton manager. And the offer from them, even in 1985, was double what I was getting at Aberdeen. And it, so it was about £400, I think, from Charlton, which was amazing for a boy who had no football background before us. I was just a folk at part-time. Here I was with, with uh, Charlton wanting to sign me for £400. But I think I didn't bother. I, I Met the charity manager, Lenny Lawrence, spoke to him, and then we got back up to Aberdeen. And when Alec, Alec Ferguson wanted to sign me, as I say, come down with Wally Gardner at some Blaine, and he offered the, the, the £200 a week for Aberdeen. You know, I signed it before I even saw what the contract was. As I say, ironically, when I got the contract, it was a year, a year longer, it was four years. But Ian Porterfield, who became the manager after Alec Ferguson, must have saw my contract, and he immediately gave me a new contract, uh, even though I was still basically playing away in the reserve under, understudy Alec and Wally. Uh, and he increased the, the, the offer by, I think it's £100, so it was up to £300 a week, three years after I'd signed by Alec. But in saying all that, I don't, no, no disrespect to Alec Biggs for, for giving me, the, he was just getting the best deal for a young player by a potential. Thankfully, the potential came to fruition. But I, again, I'll go back to that kind of naive, innocent way that sounds pathetic, really, but I just wasn't bothered about the money. I was just wanting to sign for Aberdeen. That's just unheard of nowadays, players who just, you know, don't even look at the paper. They just, I'm so yeah. wanting to sign for Aberdeen. And, you know, as fans, I'm sure I speak for everybody here, you know, it's that passion and belief that made you a firm favourite amongst us all. We just wish there was more players that had that desire to play with their heart rather than their their you know their fucking bank balance. Unfortunately, there yeah. isn't a like that now. Maybe Andy Considine is probably one of the, the few that's in the current team anyway that sort of lives lives with that in his heart. Um, what was your memories of Alex Ferguson? How, I mean, you know, what was the training like compared to where you what you'd had and where you were going and you know in oh, your career? He was, he was he knew, I mean, stuff was fantastic. The training routines we did with with so Alex was. were. The sort of things that we carried on with Alex Smith, the jockey Scott, it was all, it was pretty much standard SFA coaching drills, but they were really good. What was good about Alex Ferguson was his detail with opposition, for example, when you're playing and, you know, initially I travel with the team rather than playing with the team in Europe. Uh, you get into such detail with the, 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 the dossier and the opposition that you felt as if you knew your opponent, even though you didn't, because it was obviously a foreign guy in a different country and it wasn't the the same coverage, he didn't really get the same. Uh, Ronaldo would be Ronaldo today, I guess, but he didn't know who you're up against. But with the, the dossier he got from Alex and his, his coaching team at the time, Alex Ferguson, you felt as if you knew who you're up against. And that was the detail he went into, you know. And I think it was no, mis- no accident he, he was such a tremendous manager, you know. And, and 
And also, what I also found about Alex Ferguson, his man management was unbelievable. Unbelievable. He, he, he could put the arm around you, and it wasn't just the hair dryer stuff that you well know about. That was for the guys that needed that. But he also knew that some guys responded better a different way, so the arm would go down. Um, I was probably one of them. I was better responding when you know he was he was kind of helping you rather than shouting at you. And he never, and I'm not saying he never shouted at me, but he was always in the, on my side. Always, he felt it was a father figure with, and you know, the mark of the man is also when he left Aberdeen and went to Manchester United and probably met hundreds of guys, thousands of guys other footballer, he still had time to get back to you if you ever got in touch with him for advice. And I can remember the last time when I went to Elgin as the manager after I played, after my playing was finished, and he, he gave me some advice about what to do and advised me to do it. Probably with what happened to Elgin, it'd be better if he'd said no, but you know, it was a it was a natural advice was to go and try management. And I tried it uh, with his with his backing and that gave you that confidence to go into it with, with somebody like that's backing because you, you just Every base was covered by him. He just was a man manager to the extreme and the detail and what he knew and all the football stuff was second to none. And you, you must have been obviously in awe. First of all, it's your boyhood club. You're joining it. You're joining it after their most ever successful period. They've just, you know, they've just beaten Real Madrid, Bayern Munich, yeah. some of the biggest clubs in the world. They've just won the European Cup Winners Cup, the Super Cup. They're winning the leagues. They're winning, and then he leaves. So, I mean, that must have been a bombshell. I mean, how did that feel when, when you knew he was going? Yeah, that, that, I can remember these, these dates quite clearly, even though they're what, 40, years, 40 years nearly ago. You know, and I can remember watching the European Cup Winners' Cup, you're, you're saying at my granny's house and just outside in Barouri the night, and then going to Aberdeen the next day for the, the, bus, the bus parade. Um, I can remember clearly, though, when Alex Ferguson, uh, Tiger, this club secretary, came out in the Mert to pick Alex Ferguson up for some of the training. We were out with the young boys doing some training at Seaton Park. And uh, Ian Taggart came to pick him up, took him away, and then went home at night to realise what had happened was that he'd been called to go to a meeting with Manchester United. And so that was the last he saw him as a man, Aberdeen manager. I mean, Archie Knox finished the training that day with his young boys, the reserves and things. And he took over the first team for the weekend before he went out to Manchester United with so I like, but you never saw him again. And so yeah, that left a massive hole. And you know, not just Aberdeen, but Manchester United have struggled to find a replacement for him. I think just the, 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 the sort of the way he presents himself is just like one of these people. You, you know, you give him the the respect when he walks in the room, and he's everything the the media portray about him is, is probably true. He's a kind of one of these mountain men. You know, he's just bigger than the the. the physical size he is, he just, and, uh, you know, so when that goes away from the club, it's a massive loss and throughout the club, from the young boys to the first team, and, you know, everybody just missed him, and it was always going to be a hard act to follow for Ian Porterfield, unfortunately, it was almost an unwinnable situation for him. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, when Moyes took over at Man U's, it really just, you know, exactly. good, good manager potential, but it just didn't work out for them. Um, yeah. Coming away from, from that side of it, to some of the things, you know, some of us have got superstitions, rituals, and so on. Have you ever, did you ever have anything like that? Have you got somebody you used to do before you started a game? I mean, I'm sure a few of us could do with a few prayers, but uh, is there anything yeah. in particular that you did before you before you started a game? I, no, that's a good... Um, I'm, not, no, no, I'm not superstitious, but I did, I'm pretty much quite a regimental type of guy. So my routines... So uh, what is the difference between a routine and a superstition? I don't know. But I had my routines about how I'd put on my, you know, my socks. And I think Stuart McKinney once noticed that the way I pulled my right sock up, I put my hands between my legs to pull up the left sock after I put my right one on. So, And it was always the same one I put on first and then put the left one on after the right in a certain way. But it wasn't a, a superstition in my head. It was more just a routine. And I'm very much a man of routine. It's just the way I am. I like everything to be nice and organised. And you know, I'm a, when I worked in the bank, for example, before I joined Aberdeen, I was quite good with numbers. So I've got that, that side of my brain's okay. But when it comes to the creative side, I'm useless. You know, I'm not good at inventing things or or seeing the picture after it's happened. I'm more kind of I'm one of these guys that sees something once it's happened. I think, well, that's obvious. 
but you'd never ever see it happening before it happened, you know, because it's not how, not how my brain works. So yeah, I, had, I definitely had routines um, in my build-up. I always ate the same thing for, for three match meal, for example, and just in the dressing room, you get ready in a certain way, but I tend not to think it's a superstition, more a routine there, eh, Adam. You've, um, you've had seven goalkeepers behind you during your 12 years at Aberdeen. Um, I jotted them down just for memories. Probably probably, yeah. probably the one in the corner, the one that calls himself Manisha. I, I mean, his name's Craig, but he's probably the oldest one here that probably remember. But Brian Gunn, Jim Layton, yeah. Theo Snelders, Bobby Mims, Michael Watt, Derek Stilly, and Nicky Walker. Those are the names yeah. of the goalkeepers that would have would have been there in your time but you're no stranger at the sticks yourself you, you went in goals a few times for us didn't you yeah <laughs> I mean today yeah, that's hard to believe when you've got two sub uh, one sub goalie and you've got a, a whole team of subs now where you've seen in the, the bench or whatever and in my day in the early days it was two subs no goalkeeper and then it went to two subs plus a goalkeeper but before it you know before it got to a sub goalkeeper you'd no sub substitute goalkeeper. So in the early days, I think it was six, the first time out in the goal to replace Jim Leighton in the game against Hamilton. It was when Jim Leighton got a bad injury and he got caught in the chin, similar to the one later on with Theo, Theo Snelder. But first of all, with Jim, he got a bad one and had to go off with half an hour to go. But thankfully, we won 2-0 and um, there's no issues. A few crosses, no, no spectacular Put, uh, fingertip saves in the top corner like that but just because I was the tallest and I did used to try shots in the goals at training and things like that so at that time that was the reason behind that I would go in the goal so that was the reason behind the first one then then the other one was quite a bad injury again to Theo in a, a, a game that shouldn't have been played at the Torby when we were playing Rangers and it was pouring the rain and Ali McCoy went in caught Theo in the, right in the chin Um and it, they blamed the conditions, but actually, Ali, Ali McCoy was horizontal and off the ground, so there was no no reason he slid in the ground. It's just a bad tackle from him. But anyway, he'll get a really bad one in the on the chin there, it dislocated his his jaw, whatever it was, bad, a really bad injury. But anyway, I took over for that half hour. He went off in pouring rain, but managed to hold out for a nil nil against Rangers. So my hundred percent clean sheet record is good. When the third time it happened, when Theo got sent off at, at Easter Road and um, he brought the guy down for a penalty, so I had to go off. And it, I took over for the third time. And my first thing in that game was to face a penalty, obviously, that Theo had given away. But thankfully, it was, uh, uh, I can't remember who the guy's, but, uh, no, I can't remember, it's so long ago, but who was taking the penalty for him. But anyway, I saved it. So the record carries on, but an injury time. Injury time, uh, Daniel Lennon, perhaps managed to get a goal to beat us 1 0. That was Alex Smith as the manager. So that was the only goal I lost in the three games. Three games in the goals and one goal in injury time, but one penalty save, Adam. That's incredible, isn't it, really? Well done. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, now, you obviously scored the decisive goal. We heard the footage earlier. Um, you're the last player, effectively, to beat Celtic in a cup final for Aberdeen. 31 years ago, I personally yeah. remember being uh, at my grandma and granddad's house in Tilly Drone, hiding behind the couch. We were all like this, and yeah. you, you did it. And it's still one of my fondest memories now with football because I remember being with my family. Um, yeah. How did that feel for you, knowing that you had just, you well, first of all, you had to step up. It was not, it was 8-8 eight, eight at the time. You, um, I think they just missed out. I feel Snell there saved a, a pen, yeah. and it was up to you. If you scored, we won. And as a boyhood fan, you know, the chance to win the cup for Aberdeen and you did it. I mean, how, how did that feel? What, what was that like? That's that's the dream come true, isn't it, moment? That, that's, you think, how did, without a doubt, that's the, the ultimate. You can't really script that. Um, and I, and the fact that I was last to take, you know, I was the last outfield player to take a penalty. We're in sudden death. And, you know, I was last. And the only reason I was next one was because there's nobody left, <laughs> you know. But that was because I wasn't that confident. I didn't want to take a penalty and miss for Aberdeen and then lose the cup for Aberdeen. Not because it had been bad for me, but it just been bad for Aberdeen. And so that's why, and because Celtic were always scoring the first penalty before us, they were always first and they were scoring. So if they, they, they scored, so we missed, Celtic won the cup. 
So you have to be confident in the sudden death, even though you're not first in the queue, to take one. So unless you felt confident, the right thing to do was not to, to go forward until you, you, know, you had to. So I'm in the fourth position the come, time it comes to me. Theo's just made a great save, and I'm in the win-win position that if I could score, Aberdeen would win the cup. And as you say, Adam, the, the, the excitement now, as much then, was just that I, I could do something, not only be an Aberdeen supporter and play a game on a Saturday for Aberdeen, but actually do something that helps Aberdeen win the cup. And that was what almost, I think it probably did flash through my head even at the time. I could score here. Aberdeen are going to win. We're going to win the cup. And, you know, and it's just as, as surreal sounding now as it was in that moment 31 years ago. And what a moment when the ball hit. So I made my mind up where it was going and I saw Pat Bonner going down the wrong way. So I knew if it, as long as it went where I intended, it should be okay because he's not going to get to that side because he went down early to try and anticipate it. And I looked up right away and see the 20,000 Aberdeen fans in the, the old Hamden uh, celebrating. What a moment. What a moment. And just, you know, as good as it sounds, it was, and as an Aberdeen fan who was on the park, I like to think of it now that I'm no longer an Aberdeen player. That was my moment. If I can try and get that moment across to people like yourself, almost try and share the moment. And because you, you think, oh, but being on the park and playing in the Scottish Cup final, whatever Cup final, in a big, big game, especially, I can't do that. But that, you can now, because I've done it, and I'll never do it again. But I've tried to share it, and, and it's just as good to share it if you can grasp that moment. It's just as exciting for you being a fan, whatever you were doing at the time, as it was it on the park, hitting the ball, and Theo grabbed hold of me, and Bobby Connor he grabbed hold of me. Wow, it was just unbelievable. Just as good as you can imagine in your dreams as a fan. I feel like you've just scored it again, Brian, with that explanation. <laughs> Honestly, it was it was it was wonderful at the time. Everybody here, I'm sure, has some maybe not old enough yet to have, have experienced it in person, but seeing it on the TV and knowing it was the last cup final we won against Celtic against them. Um, you know, uh, thanks for explaining it. I really appreciate it. Um, you you play with some big characters during your time, you know, um, Charlie Nicholas, Ian Jess, Dean Windass, you know, Willie Miller, Gordon Stratton. Um, other than Alex Ferguson, who obviously had that presence that you were talking about when they came into the room, was there was there one or two other players that just as soon as they walked in, you were like, oh, gee, whoa, fuck, here's a there's a god there. Yeah, well, I mean, Charlie Nicholas had that presence when he came from Arsenal, you know. And I, I don't know if anyone saw the old video clip. I mean, any clips from my day, it's not quite black and white, but it's kind of grainy stuff, isn't it? And that's the, the great coverage we get nowadays. But you see the picture of Charlie walking up the, the, the touch line at the Tordy going into the dugout area with his long leather coat and a hat on. Oh, you know, right. Charlie was just that Charlie, which is like a superstar of the day. I don't know who the equivalent would be coming to Aberdeen. It's just like, you thought, I mean, when he was at training, he would click the ball in a certain way. You think he hits the ball so well. Um, he, he was probably the, the biggest, biggest name during the Aberdeen time. And, you know, what a player he was. And, and just a good guy as well. You know, he, he wasn't fit when he came to Aberdeen, but Jockey Scott and Alex Smith got him fit for, for um, the time we got to the, the cup final year when he, he scored the penalty before. He went to Celtic, ironically, the following season. And he was fully fit and, and back playing at his best, but just a nice guy and a good guy. Charlie um, Hans Heelhouse was another one that just had a wee bit of presence about him. Um, you know, could score goals, pace, and, you know, just a, a really good, good, good player. But, you know, I mean, you get some great characters. Billy Ed, Billy Dodge, but Davy Dodge. Dodge, was a character. Um, you know, and, and he would always strike faster. He used to get a lot of stick for his looks, Dodgy. And so he would, but Dodgy was like, he, he was like, he would take centre stage in the dressing room and he was like the, the joker and the, uh, and probably again with his looks, that was his defence mechanism. You know, he would be funny and, you know, just a character in, in the dressing room. So, yeah, there was, over the years when you think about it, there's lots of different players. The club changed a wee bit. The older type player that used to be there. Maybe I was younger at the time, and as I grew older, it's a bit like you, you look around you and the players are getting younger all the time, but it's you, it's getting older. But the team 
we did go young in, in relation to the relegation year, 95, 94, 95, with struggles with the relegation, which thankfully we avoided. But at that time, the dressing room was quite young boys, people at Billy Dodds, who was a young, young player at the time, John Ingalls, Peter Harrison, people like Colin Woodthorpe, just young boys who, who didn't have the same presence again, what I'm speaking about earlier, that, that, that these characters that work, you can identify with, and certainly I can identify it. But maybe I was younger and, and, a, and a wee bit in awe of, of some of the older guys when I was younger. But, you know, the, the players that come into Aberdeen just didn't have the same presence. Uh, and, uh, you know, I got a wee bit of stick, actually, when I did my autobiography, I think, um, and I was a wee bit critical of some of the players' attitudes. Not just, I'm saying that, that presence that they had, but I was questioning their attitude towards Aberdeen. And it was maybe okay at their clubs before, but at Aberdeen was a certain level we're used to, and I didn't think they came up to that level. Um, and, you know, that was reflected, I think, Adam, in, in the fact that we were in trouble with that. Thankfully, we got out of the relegation year, but we're nearly relegated. I could, for all that we're going about Aberdeen winning the cup and me scoring the penalty, that's brilliant. But if I had been associated with the Aberdeen team that was relegated that year, I couldn't have, that would have, that would have really put everything else eliminated. And all you could have thought is, Half empty side that or were relegated that year, and so that's why when I came into the team that year, I, I fought as hard as I could to do all I could as part of the team to help us to get out of the relegation, which thankfully we did. And that, you know, in some ways, that year was as good as the cup final year because we didn't win anything, but when we survived relegation, the whole city was behind us at the time, and it was such a great feeling that when we got out of the relegation, you know, that the it was, it was almost as good as winning a cup, although we had not actually won a cup. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember it well. I'm sure it was I'm sure a few of us do as well. It was uh, it was like a low and then and a, and a hell yeah. of a high. Thank goodness, yeah. I mean, such a I, good I, pod at I, the time. And I was, I was, what, can I just really quickly just say yeah. thank you, thank you for clarifying. It was Davy Dodds. It was a good country, not Billy Dodds. <laughs> I remember playing against Davy Dodds when I lived down near St Andrews, and I was that's yeah. when I was twenty, and he was ringing, running rings around everybody, and he's he was still as good looking as he always was like, but uh, yeah. I, no, he was he was a hell of a player actually. He really saw the class, and he must have been retired uh, a good fifteen years or something after that, you know. Um, yeah. So you played you played for your country as well, which is another amazing honour. Nine times you you played for Scotland. I know. Wow. I mean that that's. Once would have been amazing, and but, you know to get that nine caps. So it was good when I used to be towards the end of my career, and people were like yourself were speaking to me, Adam, and I'd say, "Oh, you've got nine caps," and I would always add on so far because I thought if I could get ten, that'd be brilliant, double figures. But nine's unbelievable. Nine's and un- how how no way would I have thought for a minute that I would have played once for Scotland. But it just reminds me and reminds anybody I'm talking to as well that nothing's impossible. Nothing's impossible, and it, no matter how hard it seems, when you set out, if you just chip away at it and chip away at it and keep working hard, which I did, then you'll not be necessarily become brilliant, which I wasn't. I just was, my commitment was good, my attitude was hopefully good, and I would use the ability that I had to the best of my ability, and it get you where you can, obviously getting in with the Aberdeen players at the time, I was called up for my first cap, it was because a call off to I think Richard Goff or somebody, or, Somebody called off at the time, and I, I went in alongside Alec McLeish and Stuart McKinney. So the Aberdeen connection helped me to fit in there as a kind of back four for Aberdeen. Um, so yeah, you know, never give up and never think you're never going to make it. This is football, obviously, but in anything in life, and, and sometimes I have to tell myself that now because now that you know I've finished playing, there's not a lot I can do now. And you know, I think well, I need to set my mind to someone else. I don't know because I'm not finished yet. I'm only. Well, not only I'm 55 now, but you know, but you don't have that. You don't have that same attitude you had as a youngster. Seems to be in my mind. You know, there's a wee bit of the older man's coming into my head now, and I have to remind myself more than talk to yourself or to somebody you're speaking to. Nothing's impossible because it does feel now a bit more hard. It seems harder now, and maybe things me saying it's not not impossible. But well, I think now it is a bit almost impossible. But I'd never have thought for a minute. I could have done what I did at Aberdeen and then, as you say, with Scotland. To play for Scotland nine times for a guy that really wasn't a good footballer is amazing. 
Yeah, well, we obviously appreciate that. Ninth on the most caps for Aberdeen, uh, play appearances for Aberdeen, and nine caps for Scotland. Nine seems to follow you around. Yeah. Um, the uh, last couple of questions, and then we'll get five minutes for anyone else who wants to chip in. There's, um, al there's also there's also nine guests on nine. nine guests. Oh, right. Well, nine nine nine. I suppose nine guests. Right? Hey, and obviously ex copper. <laughs> um, yes. So. Um, yeah, last couple of questions based on the current setup. Who in who in the Aberdeen team, like it could be a youngster or or you know any age really, but who in the team now um, do you do you rate the most? And um, and sort of what's your thoughts on the current struggles that we're going through? Yeah, it's not a good time. Not, not a good result today again. Even a no nil against the Manor Lose. they not a bad team, I think. So you know, but it's just in the current run of results we've been having. It's just another got points, isn't it? Um, so not not good just now, but um, the one that I'm hopeful for, but he's already kind of doing well enough to be recognised as Lewis Fergus, I think he's a great player, him in sort of midfield, uh, McCrory, you know, he, they're, they, when they're playing, when they were playing well at the start of the season, Aberdeen looked as, you know, a, a real powerhouse in the midfield, and then you've got good players up front and Aberdeen's pretty solid at the back so I thought Aberdeen's going to be really good this year you know if those two. so I think Aberdeen you know off the boil a bit recently is down to the fact that those two aren't playing so well just now and the mm -hmm. kind of engine of the team's lost its sparkle or lost its, its force um, so yeah Lewis Ferguson for me is a player with great potential um, and just you know hopefully this run we're on just now will come out of it and you know, we've still got plenty to play for, still third place to go for the with Hibs, you know, that the four was it now four or four points behind for the right, same games four, played now. Yeah. So still and, lots um, to play for though. What's um what's life for you like now then? You're you're obviously probably, you know, like a lot of it uh, as you know, furlough and stuff like that, but you're up in Inverness, yeah. is that right? Yeah, I've been in Inverness now for twenty years. When I moved to Ross County, we moved up to Inverness, but I mean I'm down in Aberdeen. Um as much as I can, although I've not been down obviously much in this current situation where you're not allowed to go outside your house. Um, so yeah, that's that's been really tough. I mean, I was an ambassador with Aberdeen, but I'm still am hopefully. But, you know, I don't do the corporate stuff when you meet and greet people. My last game was 7th of March last year against Hibs. We beat them 3-1. That was my and last game as well. I was at that game was, actually, believe it or not. Was was it? <laughs> Never for a minute did you think this was all going to be ahead this year. No. And so yeah, I mean, this has been, I, I absolutely love the ambassadorial stuff that I do with Aberdeen, mainly in meeting and greeting people with, with other people like Joe Harper and Drew Jarvie, other ambassadors. Um, the job that I do, I'm, I'm helping a man who's got learning difficulties. I, I transfer him, I take him in the, he used to be the train, but now it's in the car, down to his care home in Edinburgh, in Musselburgh. And then I, I do the reverse, take him down and pick him up and take him back to his home in Inverness where he stays with his mum and dad, Louisa. A mid thirties man, he's got learning difficulties and just obviously wouldn't be able to transfer himself between Abbott, uh, between Inverness and Edinburgh. Uh, so that's that's that care officer role I've got. And I, I've had a few similar care care jobs with uh, support of work job I, I've done with Highland Homeless and things like that. Another job I do part time is with Marks and Spencers in the stockroom, but I'm currently furloughed from them just now. So it's pretty mundane and pretty. I mean, when I'm doing markets, it's um, it's like a dungeon I work in, I call it a dungeon. And I'm, I've got maybe, you know, just get on and do the best you can, but it's, that's a million miles away from the yeah. highs that we spoke about tonight. If I Absolutely. imagine in this interview, can you tell us about your time in Mark Suspensers? <laughs> it would last about two minutes, never did be falling asleep, right? So that's that's life now, Adam. But you just got to do your best and do your yeah. best, give it your full effort. And, that's, I am I mean, Sorry, I was going to say, I imagine the effort that you put in for Aberdeen and how you've lived your life. I'm sure Marks and Spencer's are a bloody good employee, to be honest. Um, one uh, final point for me, and then we'll take maybe three or four questions. But yeah. um, we sort of meant, briefly touched on it that um, next time you're in London, you'd be quite happy to turn out for us on a Sunday. Is that right? Oh, that'd be brilliant. I'd, I'd love that. I, don't know. I mean, it's getting down to London. I'd I mean, there's a sleeper here from Inverness. I've been staying every day morning from Inverness to Aberdeen, eh, to London, sorry. So, yeah, I've done that a few times when I've had to go down and transport 
the days from Heathrow. When I, in the days when there was no Heathrow in the mess flight, if I was going up to the state side, that was another thing we've missed out there. I was, doing, I was doing a wee bit of coaching um, with the American stuff. I got I enjoyed that. It was a great experience. Then with a guy that was one of the teams I was helping him coach as an assistant, he got a job in Korea, so I went out to Korea with him uh, for a season there and enjoyed that experience as well. But anyway. So I would often sometimes have to go down to London to catch the connection from the flight, and so we get the train rather than the the, the, the flight down because it wasn't a Heathrow flight from Inverness. But now it is a Heathrow flight. But I don't know about now or right enough, but before the, the the lockdown. So yeah, I've, I've come down in that train a few times, and I, I'd love to be down and, and be great to meet meet the guys. I, I, it's great these virtual uh, Zoom calls, but I've not, no substitute for meeting people, and no. you know I've, I've missed. It meeting people in the last year has been torture for myself and I'm sure for everyone in different ways we've had to experience this time but hopefully we'll, we'll the lights at the end of the tunnel and it's hopefully not a train coming towards us but you know <laughs> that's what I think you know I think there is a wee bit of light at the end of the tunnel now Adam yeah well, if, I mean, if you're keen for the game we're always needing a centre forward so, well yeah I was out doing a coaching <laughs> clinic in Canada a couple of years three years ago I think now and I, I was an ex-players game and a, an old ex Ex guys, and I was playing up front because there wasn't a lot of running about, and but hopefully the touch is still there, but the, the movement's not there. I'm afraid you'll, 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 fit, you'll fit right in. You'll fit right in, uh, uh, you, except you for the, the touch rest? being there. That won't matter. That won't matter. That'll be that'll no, no, fight, make you stand out. Is everybody the same as me now? I'm 55, 50, 56 later in the year, but the mind's okay. The ball comes up to you, and you think, mate, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and the legs just don't react. <laughs> So that's, that's almost the position I'm in. My legs are not quite in coordination with my brain now. Um, well, some maybe, of our, never, maybe never were, Adam. Some of our 20-year-old players, are, that's how they play games. So, uh, you know, you need to get in. <laughs> We've guys, got a couple of minutes. So, is it, anyone, it, so I've got a question for, for Brian. If you have put your hands up like this, so I know you want to do a question. I was just going to say, Adam, in fairness, our 20-year-old players, that's mostly because they're still pissed. <laughs> Callum's usually pissed on these calls. So you'll, you'll get the... You'll get to know. He's our, well, uh, our manager, by the way. Callum's the manager of the team. How you doing, Callum? Well, Hi, Callum, I'd have, a good, I'd have a good attitude. I was teetotal as a player, but I do enjoy a, a wee red or a wee glass of wine now. So as long as we have a good game, and then after the game, we can have a wee drink, boys. Boy. Well, if a glass a day is good for your heart, how fucking good must a bottle be? Uh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Moderation. Right, we've got, I think Andy and Eamon probably want to have a question. Is that right? So, Andy, you go first, Nick. I was, I was just going to ask, do you, do you, like, when you're watching the game now, do you still watch with, like, an analytical, like, as, as a player? Or has the game changed so much that you don't really see it like that anymore? Or, like, That's a great question. No, great question, Andy. Great question. Thank you. I was a wee bit analytical when I was, when I finished playing, because I was still seeing it from the playing side. And then I, I went into the radio and also some coaching stuff. I spoke about their American and Korea. So you're still looking at, if anything, you're a bit more detailed from the coaching element. But I think now, uh, my last throw of the dice almost, although I was in the academy with Ross County a couple of years ago, um, the last, last proper professional full adult work I was doing was in Korea in 2015. So really for the last four or five years, I, I would look at football now from more of kind of uh, is a genuine supporter now so you're just watching it and obviously this year's a nightmare they're not really even going to a, a live game it's just watching highlights of TV so yeah it's just gra- it's a bit like life it's just everything's gradually come down and you're doing less and less but it's um, coaching so there is so much to it when you played I didn't have a coaching thought when I was playing I just thought I'm a centre half when my headers when my tackles late to somebody in the midfield who knows how to use the ball better than me and that was my job done but from a coaching point you can see that you know the different formations and how players can uh, influence games of and you know when you see a manager making a substitution that's a big decision and it can be a major decision how the outcome of the game goes so you know I think that's a good question Andy but I I did have it initially, but I think like everything else in my life, it's just all drifting away and I'm becoming more of a more of a fan. Like I see you've got it looks like a Scotland rugby top on. So I was watching the rugby this afternoon and I have no idea what's happening in the rugby. 
It's just like everybody's stumbling into each other. And we were robbed. Oh, we were robbed. That's what was happening. It was very, very <laughs> exciting. Man. I know. But yeah, so uh, just, uh, just gradually lost the, 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 the thing I used to with my job, but it's now become just like a, a something I watch on TV. Back to just loving it again, yeah. Back to, yeah. Uh, yeah. Eamon, Eamon, you've got a question, and, and then Adam Galloway will finish up with you, mate. So, Eamon, on you go. Oh, well, Andy's put me to shame with my question, but I was going to ask Brian, when you were at um, Elgin City, did you ever bail at the Joanna's nightclub after a game? I know Joanna's, I knew it was there yet. Yeah. Um, it's not there now, is it? Uh, it still was. I don't know if it'll open up again, but it was, it was a couple of years ago. Was it? No, but no, I never, I never, even in the Elgin days, I, I was still relatively free total then, but not quite because I was, I, I was still trading with the players. I was still almost, I was still registered as a player at the time at Elgin. Um, and it's just really since I stopped playing, I, I, I kind of, as I say, I enjoy my glass of wine or two or three, or you know, but, you know, Joanna's, yeah, that does, that rings a bell, but it's more like, Maybe keeping the guys out of there and me being in it was more than my issues. A manager at a time in Elgin. <laughs> uh, Brian, thanks, Brian. No uh, Adam Galway, do you, want, do you have you got a question, Adam? I've... Sorry, on you go. Un unmute it. Sorry, hold on. Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, you can hear me. Thanks very much. Right. What do you make of the whole situation to do with Ronald Hernandez and the club signing of the amount of money that they did? Him not getting a chance. And he's on holiday. And he's on holiday. Well, he's on compassionate leave at the moment. What do you What do you make of that whole situation from an outsider slash insider point of view? Yeah, I mean, I think now he's just pure as a supporter now to have no idea what the reason behind it. There will be a reason behind it, and we don't get the full information. But for me, it just seems wrong. It seems it's not being good use of you know the, the club's money. And you know it's wrong. It's just been a waste of not a waste of it. How, how come your uh, a hand like that's come up on the? I've put, I've, I've raised my hand. I've done it officially via Zoom. All right. Is that <laughs> I, what it is? I don't support Hitler. Sorry, yeah. let me remove it. I've lowered. No, it's all right, Adam. I just saw it there. That's it. No, I just thought when the <laughs> Adam's got his hand up, uh, makes it. I see. I'm saying it, but I don't see the obvious. Now you've told me that it's so obvious why the hand up. You <laughs> obviously ask you a question. But I'm like, what's that hand doing there? And it's distracting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what you think, but just purely without knowing any detail behind it, it just seems to be a it's not right. I mean, it's you know it's a waste of time, really, isn't it? There's been a lot but of confusion around. There's been a lot of confusion about why you would pay that much money for a exactly. player when you know you're not going to play a system that has a right back in it, and he's a right yeah. back. I could have yeah. understood it to replace Shea Logan 100 percent when we played Shea yeah. Logan, but we don't. It just makes no sense as a fan. It, it's, and even for me, as I say, as a fan now, just purely, I'm the same. It just seems to have been a waste, a waste of time. It's frustrating, isn't it? That's, but that's the other thing there, Adam, is un unfortunately managers can't make 10 signings and all 10 will be brilliant and a yeah. great success. So that every manager, when he makes his say, five signings, he knows in the back of his head that maybe one of them's not going to be a success. And that's just, that's just fact through and time. And, it's just what happens, unfortunately. Somebody, some guys work out, some guys don't. Yeah, yeah, true. Thanks very much. All right, well, I think unless anyone... Last last question, if anyone's got it. I was just going to say, it's very true what I said about managers. Can't, not every sign can work out. And Louis, sorry, you're not invited back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Brian, I really, we, all, we all really, really appreciate you, um, you know, tuning in and... You know, hopefully we'll, we will see you down in London and, um, you know, we, we, we'll definitely have a beer after the game. And no, be a slot. We do roll in subs and things now. So, you know, you can come on for 10 minutes and go for half an hour, 20 minutes, whatever it is a bit. But yeah, if you're up for it, then, you know, we would love to have you. So, um, you no know, question, who be on the penalties? <laughs> <laughs> we have a go. Where, where these plays at? No, where are these plays? Obviously, London's a big place. Uh, it's, it's not that far from Heathrow. Yeah, it's well, right. I mean, and I, I live at, near Windsor now, so I'll pick you up from Heathrow and we'll take right. you to the ground at Chiswick. That's what it is at Chiswick. All right. That's a day. Let's, I mean, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but we no. can make it happen. And, that, and that, I think it can happen. I'd love to join you. It'd be great fun. I'd really love to do that. that yeah. I mean, whether it's a flight or a train, it's not. 
that expensive to get down either. So it's it's doable, and it's obviously not doable just now, but it'll no. be doable. And we'll do. We'll try and do I'd love it. We'll try and do it in a bank holiday, Brian, and then we can yeah. we can go out in a piss. <laughs> and, and, and it's it's only a five day match day. It's five pound match day fee. <laughs> oh, we'll handle that. That's all right. We'll have your cup winners medal just uh, just as an ex- exchange, you know. But, but look, everybody, let's uh, thank Brian for his time and yeah, you know. Thanks, Really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Cheers, guys. Thank you. All the best. Have a great one. And God bless. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Adam. Thanks for having me. There's my hand up. <laughs> Thanks for having me. See you again. See you all soon. Cheers. Yeah, cheers, Brian. Yeah. Take care. Cheers, guys. Bye. All right. Bye. So, did everybody, That's pretty cool. Did you enjoy yeah. that? Alberto's yeah. going, going, who the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. I, I, actually, Albert, I, had to, I had to I had to ask Callum. You were you were three years old at the time, Alberto. You must have you must have watched the 1990. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. he, he was a defender for Aberdeen, uh, Alberto. He, he played for 12 years for us. And um 